Now that the war in Vietnam is over, long over, in order to heal the wounds of war and to begin reestablishing some kind of new American presence and policy in Southeast Asia, should we recognize the Democratic Republic of Vietnam? No, well, under no circumstances. Uh, there's really nothing in it for us in terms of our policy towards Southeast Asia, uh, even though some of those countries down there perform us suggest that that be done. Uh, but there's a geopolitical reason that we must not do so, and that is that the Chinese uh, are violently against the Vietnamese government because the Vietnamese government at the present time is totally under the control and su being supported by Moscow. So at this point, we should stay right where we are. Some uh, critics claim that your administration was obsessed with uh, secrecy. Uh, some claim that it, uh, it, it stems from, from your own character, that you have a secretive nature, and that this carried over into the operations of your uh, uh, administration. Uh, thinking about the leaks uh, of information, leaks are endemic in Washington. They, they always have existed, they always will exist. Shouldn't you have accepted leaks as a fact of life and not become so uh, concerned with them that you had to resort to things like wiretaps and uh, which which turned out to be unsuccessful anyway well I think there are two parts of that question as I understand it uh, first that we were obsessed with secrecy uh, as a matter of fact you're being too kind I was paranoid or uh, almost a basket case with regard to secrecy and Henry Kissinger as well because believe me if you think I was tough on these leaks uh, he was even tougher at times uh, because he thought it was jeopardizing his negotiations. Uh, the second point we should have in mind is that uh, we were strongly urged to do something about leaks by two of our predecessors. I remember so well the first conversation I had with uh, President Johnson after the election uh, in 1968. Uh, we were in the Oval Office, uh, and he had read in the paper that I had planned, uh, after my talk with Kissinger, uh, to reinstate the regular meetings of the NSC, uh, which he had uh, put on the back burner and had little private meetings uh, which were totally secret. He said, you will live to regret this. He said, "You things are going to leak out of those meetings when you have people sitting around in the back of the room, the note takers and the rest. He said, you know, sometimes I couldn't even tell Hubert things. He said he'd leak because he wouldn't know he was doing it. He just liked to talk. Uh, so he urged me not to do it. Uh, he also said a very interesting thing, which I didn't really understand until later. He says, you know, I couldn't have been president without J. Edgar Hoover's assistance in trying to track down some of these things. And then I remember too well, as well, uh, that when uh, we were in office, that I went out to brief Eisenhower with regard to a new initiative that uh, we were trying to implement through the NSC system uh, with regard to the Mideast. Uh, he was very interested in it. Uh, a couple of days later, it was in the press. Uh, Eisenhower didn't call me, he called Kissinger, uh, and he said, shape up your shop. If you don't stop these leaks, you're not going to be able to have a policy. Uh, so that tells you what they think. Now the other point that you make with regard to why secrecy? Uh, why should we care about whether or not people leak? In other words, uh, aren't, aren't the people entitled to know? And my answer is the people are, but not the enemy, <laughs> not our opponents. Uh, and by that I mean that, and I'll put it quite bluntly, without secrecy, we would not have had the opening to China. No way the Chinese would ever have done that in public forums because they had the Russians that they feared in this respect. Uh, they had a number of other internal problems, uh, those that opposed any rapprochement with the United States. It had to be done secretly, and that was an enormously important event which could not have been accomplished without those secret trips that Kissinger took and the secret negotiations we had uh, through the White House channels. Without secrecy, we wouldn't have had the meetings in Paris, uh, which reached the agreement with the North Vietnamese and brought the peace agreement, which ended the American involvement in Vietnam. Couldn't have been accomplished without secrecy, because people will say things secretly that they won't say publicly when they're talking to a much broader, broader constituency. And without secrecy, as a matter of fact, we wouldn't have had the negotiations with the Russians that led to the first strategic arms uh, control agreement. 
so I am simply suggesting to my successors in this office, uh, have an open administration to the extent that you can. It's much more popular, particularly with the members of the media. But remember, the most important thing to do is to make progress in solving particularly great international problems. You cannot make progress at times in public forum. Uh, let the media know, unless letting the media know uh, is going to abort an initiative you're attempting to undertake. This makes uh, logical sense, but isn't it really deeply, basically inconsistent with the, the ethic of democracy? Uh, let's take a worst case. Let's assume that uh, there is a president who either has uh, uh, bad intentions, which I guess would be the very worst case, or a well-intentioned president who has a, a policy that turns out to be disastrous. If he has the ability to carry it out behind the scenes in secret, to carry it to fruition, how that we, that we then have to live with the results of that. How can you balance the need for secrecy in order to get things done with the kind of checks and balances that are built into the democratic system and keep it on an even keel? Well, let me say with regard to secrecy uh, that there are some you do confide in. Uh, for example, when I had the secret bombing of Cambodia, I did inform uh, Senator Russell and Senator Stennis, both Democrats, uh, because I knew uh, that they uh, as key Democrats uh, could keep a secret. And that's not they approved it. But let me say your, two. Your critics, though, would charge that you chose the two key Democrats who you knew in advance would, uh, because of your relationship with them and because of their background, uh, would approve. Uh, no, not your, necessarily. Your not particularly in the case of Senator Russell. He was very much disenchanted with the war, uh, even though he is always known to be a hawk. No, I chose them because I knew they'd keep their counsel, and I couldn't say that, frankly, for some of the Republicans. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of, the, uh, of uh, how we are to operate, uh, we have to have in mind uh, that uh, it's most important for a president, for an administration, in the field of foreign policy to be effective. We have to have in mind, too, that it is a fact of international life, uh, that in the world we live in, uh, negotiations that are private are a way of accomplishing things. And this is particularly true, may I say, particularly true when you're dealing with totalitarian states. Secrecy to the Soviet Union, to the Chinese and so forth, uh, it's a way of life for them. And if you don't move in those secret channels, you're always going to be fighting things out propaganda-wise. Let me say, it was very difficult for me. I'd, I'd like to have gone out and huffed and puffed in front of the media about all the great things I was doing to bring rapprochement with China and get a lot of plaudits and kudos in the New York Times and Washington Post and CBS, NBC, and ABC. But on the other hand, what I wanted to do was have results. And if I'd had those kudos, we wouldn't have had the results. Uh, so I say uh, it is very important, of course, to inform uh, the country. Uh, once you have made a breakthrough, uh, it is very important, too, uh, to submit to the Congress uh, to the extent that the Congress has responsibility. Uh, for, uh, the, for approval, uh, the programs. But on the other hand, the, the negotiations uh, of, in these particular areas have to be, in many cases, accomplished through secret, or should I say, private channels. What about the critics who would say that in your conduct of the war, you purposely avoided the democratic processes, which would have involved uh, going to Congress or informing larger numbers of congressmen, because you knew, which turned out to be the case uh, in 1972 and 1973 that if you went to them, they would essentially stop the war. They would stop the funding. If they knew what you were intending to do, they would have stopped it. No, that was true, I would, I think we should say, uh, in the Johnson years. I mean, in, in the Johnson years, uh, we went in, as some people have said, by stealth. Uh, and the Congress, uh, it approved very early on sort of a general uh, approval of uh, a, pr a program in this instance, but it w Johnson did not inform them along the way. But let me say, on the contrary, in my case, if you look over the record, uh, I addressed the country over and over again publicly on television on these issues with regard to our withdrawal program, with regard to our training of the Vietnamese, uh, with regard to, to uh, our uh, incursion into Cambodia and explained what we were doing. I was going over the heads, I may say, of the media, uh, most of whom were opposed uh, to anything except a bug out, 
and I was going over the heads of some of those in Congress uh, who would have opposed anything except a bug out. But on the other hand, there was no question uh, but that the Congress was well informed of what we did and could at any time, uh, prior to the time we reached the peace agreement, uh, put thumbs down on it. They didn't do that because I had the support of the country. Uh, it's very important to recognize that the President of the United States is not just speaking for the Congress. They are the people's representatives and because they also have been elected. But he represents, he's the only person in this country, he and the Vice Pre uh, President, who represent all the people. And he has a right and should go over the heads of the Congress, over the heads of the media, to the people when he believes that the people's support uh, may override congressional opposition. Do you think you ever got fair treatment from the media? Possibly, uh, some say, I mean, as president, I assume you're asking, uh, not the earlier years. Uh, I would say that some would say that I got uh, uh, fair treatment uh, on the China initiative. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, it was one that uh, many of the media considered to be a great adventure, and I think some of them honestly thought it was a major achievement. Uh, as Henry Kissinger used to ruefully say, he says, well, he said, they're supporting it, but they're, they really are sorry we did it. <laughs> they only wish that one of theirs had done it. Now, as far as the media is concerned, let me understand, uh, I hold no personal grudges. Uh, I, I know that some people say, do, do I hate the press? I was asked that once in a press conference, and I said, no, I, I, you only hate people you respect. Uh, I don't mean I don't respect many in the media, but those in the media, for example, on the war issue, uh, who supported uh, Kennedy's uh, getting us involved in Vietnam, which was proper in my position, in my opinion, who supported Johnson when Johnson was campaigning against Goldwater in Johnson's Vietnam uh, position, and then who uh, uh, deserted ship in effect uh, once the public opinion began to turn against the war, and then sabotaged me, in my opinion, or tried to, uh, when I was trying to bring the war to an honorable conclusion, as far as those in the media, and they are several of them, there are several of them, I don't have any respect for. I don't hate them. Uh, it's just a matter, I would say, of mutual contempt. I'm sure they share the same feeling toward me. You talk about a, uh, the people who wanted to bug out of Vietnam. What, what, what is a bug out? A bug out is what, uh, for example, the Democratic caucuses in both the House and the Senate voted for uh, in 1972. Uh, it, in effect, says, bring back our prisoners of war. Uh, if we get those from you, uh, we will withdraw all of our support from the South Vietnamese so that the North Vietnamese would be able to impose their government on the South uh, with, of course, all the consequences that have come from that, as we have well seen. Uh, I think Mel Laird put it pretty well once, though, when the prisoner of war issue was beginning to get very, very hot. He said, look, uh, we can't be in a position of fighting these war, this war, uh, in order to get back our prisoners of war. Uh, and I must say that he was exactly right. Uh, so a bug out basically is w something uh, where we say the war in Vietnam was wrong. Uh, we shouldn't be in there in the first place. It's been conducted the wrong way. It's costing more than it can possibly gain. So the thing we have to do is to get out and let Vietnam, South Vietnam, fend for itself, which would have meant a communist takeover, which of course is what happened when we cut back on them, which was incidentally a modified bug out. Uh, whenever your friends uh, don't have the support in tanks and arms and so forth that your potential enemies have, uh, they're going to lose. Why do you think uh, so many of these people who were smart, sophisticated, uh, involved, aware people were in your judgment so wrong in their assessment of why Vietnam wasn't important to us. How was it possible for the, the, uh, the leaders of uh, Congress, the, uh, the leaders of, uh, in, in the universities, uh, the thought leaders, indeed uh, uh, arguably the American establishment wanted us to bug out? Why were they, how could they be so wrong? When you describe these people, they are what we call the best and the brightest, the best and the brightest in the media, in the universities, in the foundations, even in the uh, some parts of the business community, and of course in the Congress. Uh, it's been difficult for me to understand. I think 
Part of it was because they were turned off by, frankly, the horrors of war, uh, war being in living color on television night after night. Uh, uh, this was the first war fought on color television, as you know. Uh, they were turned off, too, uh, by what they considered to be uh, the excesses of the Vietnamese government. Uh, they had a double standard. They could see the danger on the right. Uh, they saw it in Vietnam. They saw it, for example, in Iran. Uh, they saw it in Cuba. And yet, who would say, for example, that Cuba is better off under Castro than it was previously? Who would say, for example, today that Iran is better off under Khomeini than it was under the Shah? Uh, and in the case of Vietnam, who could really say that Vietnam is better under the communists than it was under Thieu? Uh, it seems to me that when you look at it that way, it is difficult to understand how the best and the brightest, because uh, they were overwhelmed by seeing the horrors of war, uh, uh, because also they felt that the war was very divisive at home, and it was, uh, that they said, well, get it off our plate and turn to other things. Uh, and let me say, the fact that it was divisive at home, I think, uh, was a major factor, because in the university communities and the rest, uh, college faculties and so forth, just didn't want to stand up for the activists, students, and particularly the professors. Do you think, uh, talking about the American establishment, do you think it is the best and the brightest? Do you think it is the brightest but not the best? Uh, the American establishment certainly can't be faulted on brains. Uh, we have more college graduates per capita than any country in the world. Uh, we have excellent institutions. The whole world comes to America now, just as Americans used to go, for example, in the 19th century and early 20th century to Germany, for example, in the field of science, uh, to Britain, if you want to learn something about political science and the rest. Uh, in terms of the best, uh, in terms of character, uh, in, in I would say uh, that I think that the American uh, university community uh, has got to look very carefully at what has happened. Uh, what, what is the situation today, for example, when a Jean Kirkpatrick uh, or a Bill Buckley uh, happens to be denied the right to speak uh, on a university campus, uh, and then your faculty just doesn't have the backbone uh, to face down the demonstrators and so forth and let them speak, and why an Ellsberg goes there and is, uh, is received like a hero. Uh, now, what I'm saying here is uh, that as far as the American establishment is concerned, uh, it certainly is very bright. Uh, but in terms of responsibility, of facing up to the real world, uh, of distinguishing, and these are hard distinctions to make, to, make be uh, to distinguishing between uh, governments that don't meet our standards, but understanding that the choice often is not between something perfect and something imperfect, betwe but between uh, something which is not good between something that is much worse. It's on these scores that I think the American establishment has uh, really forfeited its right to lead. Uh, and I trust, and incidentally having said that, there are a substantial minority uh, who know this and are attempting to turn it around. I hope they prevail. If it follows that the best or that the brightest people make the smartest choices, why is the American establishment liberal? Of course, the brightest people don't always make the right choices. Uh, this is not just a modern phenomenon. It goes back through history. Uh, we often find uh, that as far as leaders are concerned, uh, some of them have been intellectual geniuses. Uh, others have not. Uh, but far more important uh, than a high IQ is good judgment. Uh, far more important than whether you lead your class uh, is whether or not uh, you have the strength and the character uh, in a crisis to stand up against the mob. Uh, I would say above everything else, uh, far more important uh, than doing what is fashionable. And these days, so many people are affected by what is in fashion, the trendy business, is to do what is right. Uh, as I've often said, uh, a, the responsibility of a leader is not to follow public opinion, what is trendy, uh, but to change it. Uh, when he believes it should be changed. Not to follow the polls, but to change the polls. Uh, and I would say that in terms of much of the American establishment, it's 
that is the case. I would say finally in this respect, we have to understand that uh, most of the American establishment coming out of the universities and so forth, it's liberal. Uh, and generally, those coming out of universities uh, have a liberal background. Why is that? Uh, it is because you have, uh, from historically, from way back, uh, that those who, who sit in the great universities and so forth are not in the real world. It's an unreal world. Uh, let me say, I speak with great respect about looking back at my own professors at, at college and in law school and many that I have known. Uh, but generally speaking, they do not live in the real world. And when they see the real world and what you have to do uh, to make choices between uh, the perfect uh, and the imperfect, uh, or I should say between uh, what is not perfect uh, from what is uh, and something uh, that is uh, worse, uh, it is this that really makes it very difficult for them. Uh, and also there's this to be said. Uh, generally speaking, when you look at the universities and so forth, uh, as uh, they're basically idealists, which is to their credit. Uh, they basically are critics, uh, and they see everything wrong around them, as they should, and they're very critical of that. Uh, but way out there, uh, they see also, uh, th they are usually taken in by those who offer panaceas. That's why communism appealed, let's face it, or Marxism, or socialism, as it even appeals today. Uh, in practice, it's been a disaster. But on the other hand, in the earlier years, in the 30s, and the 40s, and 50s, before it self-destructed by how it failed to perform, uh, it had enormous appeal uh, among the intellectual elite. I haven't given up on them. Uh, after all, they are intelligent. Uh, and I do feel that over a period of time, uh, that uh, I don't expect them to be conservative. Uh, I don't ex certainly would hope they would never be reactionary. I would always hope that they would be for progress, uh, but uh, within a democratic framework. Uh, but I would think they would be less naive about what the how the world works. If there is one most common denominator of the American establishment, my guess is that it is dislike of Richard Nixon. What is it about you that drives the establishment up the wall? I don't know uh, whether I'm the best qualified. You really ought to ask them. Uh, people often say, uh, your press relations are bad. Get a new press secretary. That isn't the problem. I could have uh, the best press secretary in the world, and that isn't going to change the attitude of the press. I think there are two things. One, uh, or maybe three. One, they don't agree with what I stand for. Uh, I am a conservative. I hope an intelligent one. Uh, un <laughs> And, uh, Is that I am, redundant? Uh, oh, yeah, not necessarily. Uh, I would say I am not reactionary, and that therefore not a very good target for them. Uh, I'm usually not reckless, and therefore not a good target. Uh, I think, for example, a second point that has turned them off is, is almost historical. I can, I'll never forget my old friend Bert Andrews, who was a, an intellectual, a, a very one of the top reporters for the New York Herald Tribune in Washington. He was the head of their office. Uh, after we'd broken the Hiss case, uh, and after I had stayed on the ticket uh, through the fun broadcast, uh, he'd had a couple of belts. Uh, and uh, I was feeling pretty good after that broadcast. And I said, well, I said, I guess uh, things are going to change. We're going to get a better press. He said, no, you won't. He said, let me tell you something about my brethren in the press. He said, uh, uh, they don't mind if you're stupid. As a matter of fact, they like it. You make a better target. Uh, they like the dummies, uh, frankly, in a way, uh, because it gives them something that they can really cut up pretty good. He said, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, when you're wrong, uh, they can take you on because that uh, puts them on the side of the right. But he says there's one thing that they cannot tolerate. There's one thing that really turns them off, and that is if you embarrass them by proving they were wrong. He said, they were 10 to 1 against you on the Hiss case. You proved them wrong. That embarrassed them. And then on the fund, uh, on the Eisenhower train, they had voted 40 to 2 that you ought to get off the ticket. With one broadcast, you proved them wrong. He says, mark my word. Uh, it isn't they hate you individually, but you have embarrassed them. And from now on, they're going to be after you. Now, that sounds a little petty, and perhaps it's way overstated. Uh, but I would say that, as far as the media is concerned, 
uh, I probably have to don't handle myself in a way they like. Uh, uh, th they like fashion, and I'm not a fashionable person. They like the trendy people. I'm not a trendy person. Uh, uh, they like uh, froth, and I'm more one who believes in substance. Uh, so basically, uh, under the circumstances, however, I think it really gets down to the fact that I am a conservative. Uh, and, and also, curiously enough, a conservative uh, who is not an isolationist, who is not a reactionary, who is for progress, who is an internationalist. As a matter of fact, I think really many of them privately resented the fact that I went to China and that their boy hadn't done it, whoever their boy was. Uh, now having said that, uh, let's simply say that uh, that's all in the past and looking to the future, I hope that when, uh, as time goes on, that they will take a more tolerant attitude or at least a more objective attitude toward conservative Republican presidents or Democratic presidents for that matter if they happen to be conservative. One of the, uh, for a number of years, one of the arguments in favor uh, of the, or one of the arguments for the necessity of fighting the Vietnam War was the domino theory, that if South Vietnam fell, the rest of the nations in Southeast Asia and Asia and the Pacific Basin would fall like a row of dominoes. Now, several years after the fall of Vietnam, the end of the war, the fall of Vietnam, the dominoes still seem to be in place. Does that mean that the domino theory was, was wrong? No, not at all. You have to understand historically how the theory developed. Uh, it developed first uh, and was first expressed uh, by President Truman and Secretary of State Acheson back in 1948 and 49 when the French were still there. Uh, and in that period, and in 1953 when I traveled throughout that area, and in 1956 when I was there again, and again back in 1964 when I was there again, in all of that period of time we have to understand uh, that communism, the idea, ha still had appeal. Uh, these were new nations, many of them. Uh, they were just trying uh, the great experiment of self-government. They were trying to find the best way to quick progress. Uh, they saw the Soviet example. And they did not see the fact that communism didn't work. Uh, now since that period, particularly in the mid-60s, the late-60s, and the 70s, that has all changed. Uh, so the communists don't have the appeal that they had, for example, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, and Malaysia, and Thailand that they had back in 1953 and 54 when the domino theory was first suggested. So what happened here is that by holding the ring in Vietnam uh, against uh, Soviet and Chinese supported uh, revolutionary warfare, uh, we bought time for those nations to develop their own systems. Uh, we bought time for the communist systems that self-destruct. Let's take Indonesia as the best example. Indonesia in the year 1962 uh, threw out Sukarno, who was left-leaning and was getting taken in by sort of the communist ideas, and put in a non-communist, a strong non-communist government. That would not have happened, in my opinion, had the United States uh, failed to hold the line in Vietnam. Uh, because And Indonesia was the most important country in that area. There's 150 million people and it has a thousand miles of strategically located islands. Was it worth destabilizing our government, uh, having hundreds of thousands of American casualties, 57,000 American dead, in order to hold the line for Indonesia, to buy time for the Indonesians? It wasn't just Indonesia. Uh, it's a question of the whole uh, area of what I call revolutionary warfare, uh, because we have to understand the dominoes are just not in Southeast Asia. Is, is one American life worth ho buying time? It is if it's going to affect us. Uh, let's well understand uh, that here sits the United States. Uh, now I think most people say, well, the United States certainly should risk an American life to save Europe. And most people in America would say we should risk an American life to save Israel. Uh, and maybe they would say we should risk American lives to save Japan because of its economic importance to us and so on. Having said that, however, we have to understand uh, that as we look at Europe, the United States, and Japan, they cannot survive uh, if basically uh, the third world, 
and that's a very big term, Latin America, Africa, the Persian Gulf, uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia, if that comes under communist domination, we will be surrounded, squeezed, uh, because our supplies will be cut off and so forth and so on. So in the long term, uh, we simply have to stand firm. We don't fight every place. Uh, in fact, we try not to fight at all. We should help others fight their own battles, uh, the so-called Nixon Doctrine. But on the other hand, we have to recognize that what happens in Indonesia, what happens in El Salvador, uh, what happens uh, in uh, uh, Iraq and Iran does matter. Where is the domino? Where are the dominoes today, and what should we be doing? How, there how, how I, I pointed that out in, in, in considerable detail in my book, The Real War. The real war is being fought uh, today not between the superpowers and not between NATO and uh, uh, the United States, for example, and the superpower, because there is no war. There's the absence of war there at the present. But the real war is being fought in the so-called third world. Third world which has the minerals, uh, which has the energy supplies, the oil and so forth, uh, which has the raw materials that is essential uh, for an industrial uh, society to survive. It's Latin America, it's Africa, both Black Africa and North Africa. It's the Persian Gulf, it's the Mideastern area, it's South Asia and Southeast Asia. That is where uh, the communists, particularly the Russians, the Chinese now being supportive uh, but playing uh, a less expansionist role than it did previously. But that is where, uh, by war by proxy, uh, through using Cuban troops, uh, war through uh, supporting revolutionary warfare and so forth and so on, where it's being conducted. And so what we have seen since the fall of Vietnam, we've seen Angola, we've seen it work there through uh, support of war by proxy. Uh, when the United States Congress refused to uh, honor President Ford's request that we do something to save that, uh, to prevent that from happening. Angola, Ethiopia, Yemen, uh, these are places far away. They don't seem to matter. But when that begins uh, to develop in other areas, it's going to matter very much. Is and it, of course, Nicaragua. Is it worth American lives to buy time for El Salvador? Oh, certainly. Uh, it's, uh, it's a small country. Uh, I've been there. Uh, uh, sad in many ways and yet hopeful too. There are four million people in El Salvador. They're very good people. Uh, I was there in 1955. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly there were reasons for a revolution to occur. Uh, but a revolution uh, which brings more repression and more corruption than they had previously is not what the people of El Salvador deserve, and that's what we're trying to prevent. But I think President de Gaulle, many years ago as a matter of fact, was very prophetic when he said, what we have to understand is that the countries of Central America are only incidents in the road to Mexico. So Nicaragua is gone, uh, despite the editorials in our great newspapers to the effect that the Sandinistas were not at the, uh, under the control of the Russians, or at least independent upon it, and are not today, and so forth. They are. There's no question about that. Uh, Nick, uh, Direct, El Salvador directly, or just in terms of uh, inspiration. Do you think Moscow is calling the tune, or just uh, setting the? Uh, I think. Mo I think. I put it this way: Without Moscow, the Sandinista government could not survive for even one month, uh, and that I think tells the story. Uh, the uh, El Salvador uh, now. It can go. Uh, now, call it domino, call it what you want, but the effect on Guatemala, where there are also uh, dissident elements or terrorist or guerrilla elements, you know, uh, who are trying to overthrow the government. Uh, let me s say in this respect, I hold no brief for the Guatemalan government, for, the Nicar uh, for certainly the previous Nicaraguan government, for the El Salvador government. Uh, they had their faults, uh, and some of them were very glaring faults. But on the other hand, uh, what I do say is that it's the old story. It's the choice between them and somebody worse or them rather than between them and somebody better. It doesn't mean that we simply say there, we support these governments right or wrong. We must, of course, use our influence 
to move them into an age of reform. Uh, that has to be the American position, always, and that's the real way to practice human rights. But it's no way to practice human rights to say, because this government or that one denies human rights, some human rights, to get rid of it, and then to bring in a government that allows no human rights. That's what's happened in Cuba, and that's what's happened in Nicaragua, and that's a bad choice. If it came to an up or down decision, and you were president, would you send American troops to El Salvador to save it? No, sir. Uh, there's where the Nixon Doctrine, which I'd like to speak just a second on, applies. Under the Nixon Doctrine, uh, which I announced in Guam in 1969, I said the problem is that in Korea and Vietnam, the United States provided the arms, we provided the economic assistance, and most of the men uh, in order to help them defend their uh, freedom from communist domination. I said, in the future, uh, the United States should provide for our friends uh, who are threatened by communist insurrection. We should provide arms, we should provide training, we should provide economic aid. But on the other hand, we should not provide the men except for technicians who for training. Because if they are unwilling to and unable to fight themselves and win, we shouldn't do the fighting for them. And that is the rule that should apply in El Salvador. Is now, there's one exception that to the what's rule. what's happening, though. We're providing this, and they're getting creamed for whatever I reason. Think, they can't I think they're going to survive. Do you think so? I think they're going to survive. If we provide the arms, you understand, we have to provide the arms, we have to provide economic assistance, and uh, we also have to provide technical training. You understand, those that are fighting against them uh, are not fighting with pitchforks. Uh, they're a pretty tough bunch, and they have some very modern weapons, and they're not just ones that have been captured uh, from the government forces. Uh, a lot of them have been our uh, Soviet imports, and of course Cuban, and so forth and so on. There's one exception in the, so far as the so-called Nixon Doctrine is concerned, and that is if a foreign government intervenes, then we have to have a reevaluation. And that, of course, is what happened in Korea. The reason the United States went into Korea is that North Korea attacked South Korea. It was not just a civil war. And the same happened in Vietnam. If the North Vietnamese had stayed out of South Vietnam, there would have been no necessity to keep any American forces there because it was North, Korea, uh, North Vietnamese tanks that rumbled into Saigon when it capitulated, not VC tanks, believe me. Should President Reagan then get on the hotline and tell uh, Yuri Andropov to cool it in El Salvador? Well, I believe that when a summit occurs, as it in inevitably will, uh, that it must not be one just zeroed in on the very important area of arms control, uh, but it should be the whole world, uh, the relations of the United States and the Soviet Union economically. Uh, the relations of the United States and the Soviet Union to the Mideast, to other areas where our interests happen to collide. We're not going to agree on everything, but we at least can set up a process to avoid war over disagreements. Uh, they call that uh, linkage and so forth, and people say, well, why don't you just get arms control alone? Uh, wouldn't that be enough? And the answer is not at all. Important. Uh, you have to remember that wars do not come because of the existence of arms. They come because of failure to resolve po to political differences that lead to the use of arms. Therefore, since the purpose of arms control ostensibly is to prevent war, that purpose is not served unless you go to the heart of the question. You have arms control, but then you leapfrog that to the differences that might bring war, and you try to cool those. Uh, and we've got to make it very clear to the Soviet that uh, as far as we're concerned, we can have arms control, we can have better trade relations, we can even help them in non-strategic areas in trade, uh, if they're willing, of course, to cool it in areas that might affect us uh, detrimentally. How do you react to uh, charges that we caused, uh, largely during your administration, that we caused serious health damage to our own troops in Vietnam by the use of the chemical defoliant agent orange? Do you, uh, and, and do you think that the government should make financial settlements for uh, soldiers uh, or, or people whose uh, health was affected by Agent Orange in yeah. Vietnam? I have not studied that, but if, if a, a, an independent study uh, indicates that uh, the government was responsible, of course, 
course they should make financial settlements, obviously. What is it? Uh, what does it feel like? I, it's probably an impossible question to answer, but it's not an impossible question to ask, and I think it occurs to people. What does it feel like to make a decision that leads to the bombing of people? You were under fire in the South Pacific. You, you experienced the, 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 the terror and the, the helplessness of that. When you're in the air-conditioned Oval Office and you're looking at maps and you're making a decision about sending out a bombing run, do you think, can you think about the people in the, in, in, in the non-air-conditioned jungles that, uh, that are going to be under those bombs? Yes, you did. I must say that in terms of Vietnam, however, uh, I at least uh, was able to order the bombing, recognizing that our bombing was very carefully restricted to military targets. Uh, in fact, our pilots, many of them, as I pointed out, may have lost their lives due to the fact that we did not allow any area bombing, including the bombing of Hanoi and Haiphong. And the records will show that we did carry that out. Uh, I remember, though, that President Eisenhower, who had a much more difficult decision, told me that one of the most uh, heart-rending decisions he made was to approve the bombing of Dresden in World War II. Dresden was not a military target. And in one night, 38,000 people were burned to death because of a firebombing. Uh, but the purpose was uh, to discourage the Germans uh, and to bring down Hitler. And it's an awful close question. Was it worth it? Uh, so I say every president has that problem. But in our case, it was not nearly as difficult as the one that President Eisenhower had or that President Truman had uh, when he ordered uh, or approved the bombing uh, with atom bombs of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. In a... Uh in a, a television documentary, General Westmoreland has been charged with uh, suppressing intelligence estimates and leading a conspiracy to conceal from the President, the Congress, and the people the uh, actual number and placement of enemy troops in Vietnam in order to convey the impression that we were winning a war that we were, in fact, losing. How do you react to those charges against General Westmoreland? Disgraceful. Uh, he's filed a libel suit. I hope he wins it. He should. Uh, I think that as far as he's concerned, I know him. Uh, he was an outstanding commander. Uh, he's a by-the-book commander. Uh, he would never allow himself to be used politically, I'm sure. I saw him out there in Vietnam to, on a couple of my trips. Uh, now, it is true uh, that what, of course, taints him is the fact that the Johnson administration, as we pointed out earlier, uh, did... Uh, uh, not level with the American people as much as uh, it should have due to pol domestic political considerations with regard to what was going on and so forth. But you can't blame that on West General Westmoreland. He would never have done it. I know the man. Looking back on the uh, American experience in Vietnam from your perspective as, as Commander-in-Chief and President of the United States, and as someone who was there from the, from a very early point uh, before we even became involved in a military sense. Looking at the billions of dollars, the millions of refugees, the hundreds of thousands of casualties, the 57,000 American dead in Vietnam, and the fact that uh, in a matter of a couple of months the whole thing went down the tubes anyway and the communists, uh, the communists won. A couple of years, I should say. Was it worth it? Well, was it worth it? Uh, I, of course, uh, obviously often ask myself that question during the times I had to make the decisions with regard to uh, Cambodia, uh, with regard to the bombings and so forth and so on. Uh, and particularly, I asked myself that question when I uh, met with the next of kin of people who had lost their lives and so forth. Uh, my answer is that the United States uh, and uh, Vietnam, as we know, uh, going back over 25 years, have been entwined together. Uh, fate brought us together in that area after the French left Vietnam. Uh, I know a case can be made, and it is made by many, that we shouldn't uh, have gone along with the policy of trying to help Vietnam prevent a communist takeover. But when you say, was it worth it, my answer is, when you see what has happened since the communists take over, there's no question about who was on the right side. More people, for example, many more people have been killed and starved to death in Cambodia 
between two and three million that have been lost by the French, by the Americans, by the North Vietnamese and the South Vietnamese in 25 years of warfare in Vietnam. And there were no boat people, may I say, when our governments, uh, the ones we were supporting, Chu, etc., Diem, there were no boat people. The traffic was all one way. Nobody went north. They all came south if they possibly could. Uh, the question is, was it on the right? Were we, uh, who was on the right side? Were we on the right side? Uh, I have no doubt about it. When I see what we were trying to prevent, when I see uh, the terrible holocaust that has been visited upon the people of South Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, I say uh, that any government with any moral sense whatever was justified in trying to prevent that from happening. Uh, and I think history will record uh, when we get further away from the trauma of defeat uh, that, it, as President Reagan has said, uh, it was a just war, if any war at all is just. Do you think that the Vietnam vet has got a fair deal? No, not at all. Uh, a fair deal, certainly, in terms of uh, education and perhaps jobs and so forth, uh, and some would even question that. Uh, but that isn't the important thing. More important than anything else for us, for a veteran after he has served there, to be come back and to be respected, to be appreciated. And uh, many of these fellows came back and they almost had to slink around in their communities, particularly if they went into the university or the colleges and so forth, in order to get the education that they were denied uh, due to the fact they're having going out there. Uh, I do not think, in other words, that the, that the Vietnam veterans have been properly recognized. That's changing some now, and I hope it changes a great deal more. And that those lucky people, particularly, who didn't serve in Vietnam, quite legally, uh, continued their college education, demonstrated against the war, and thereby prolonged the war without intending to do so. I think they should be the first to get in and say, thank you, fellows. Uh, you did your job, and uh, the country owes you a debt. That's the way I feel about it. What would you say if you found yourself uh, trapped in an elevator on a, in a 10-story building uh, with a, uh, someone who went to Canada to avoid the draft? What would you say to them now? What would you talk to them about? I don't uh, know that I can really reconstruct what could happen. I don't know what he would say, what I would say. Uh, he would probably be very bitter toward me uh, because uh, uh, in this case, uh, and I don't want to make an invidious comparison, I was like Lincoln <laughs> in the Civil War. People talk about the fact that Lincoln, of course, uh, uh, I think well, another comparison would come to his mind, but that's... Yeah. Uh, no, but the point is that I remember uh, Sandberg tells a very moving story. Lincoln was sitting uh, in the White House one day, uh, and uh, a soldier came to the front gate. Uh, he had fled to Canada rather than serving in the Union forces. Uh, he wanted a pardon, and Lincoln said, no, I will not pardon him. Uh, he must go back and serve with his unit uh, until the war is over. Uh, that was my attitude toward those that ran to Canada and so forth. Uh, I understand why they did it. Uh, some disapproved of the war. Some didn't want to take the risk of it. I understand those things. But on the other hand, let me just say, I think they've got to recognize, I don't mean that they should bear this guilt and wring their hands about it, but let them at least compensate for it by paying proper respect to those that did go. You want to remember, a few thousand went to Canada and Sweden or what have you, but two and a half million Americans went out there to Vietnam. And I'm mighty proud of them, and, and I think we all should be proud of them. Do you think those they were on the right side. Do you think those thousands that went to Canada and Sweden are as good Americans as the million that, w that served? I don't know what has happened to them since. Uh, at the time they made that decision, no. I think those that served were the better Americans of the two. Would you allow them just to re-enter uh, the society, perhaps to, uh, to expiate just by honoring the people who did serve, or oh, should certainly. they have to do something more? No, that's done now. I mean, the point is uh, President Carter, of course, is uh, uh, in effect uh, uh, very early on 
uh, made the decision that uh, they should all come back. Did you agree with that decision? Yes. Uh, I wouldn't have no, uh, but that on the other hand, that's done now. And I think the best thing now is to put that aside. Uh, th these these people, I think, deep down, deep down, uh, many of those that went, they they must have a feeling of remorse, and particularly a feeling of remorse when they see what has happened in Vietnam, in Cambodia, uh, and that is where our intellectual elite, I think. I think their problems are sort of twofold. They're going through quite a trauma. One, uh, uh, it was a war that most of them, in the first instance, supported, uh, and then they turned against it. They sabotaged uh, my efforts to get them out. They said it wasn't possible to have peace with honor. Uh, when we did get the peace with honor, uh, I think uh, it embarrassed them. Uh, but I think, think beyond that, that, that these people uh, have got to have a feeling of remorse, remorse about what happened, because it happens they were on the wrong side. Talking about the, uh, the draft uh, evaders and uh, deserters and talking about uh, uh, people like Jane Fonda and Ramsey Clark, you're very hard to interview because you're so, you, you appear to be so magnanimous or so calm, and yet it doesn't make sense that you, that you can't be passionate and furious about what these people did and the damage that they caused from, from your point of view. And it's, it's, in a way, it's been through your career, it's, it's, and it's got you the worst of both worlds, because to your opponents it proves that you're uh, phony and hypocritical, and to your supporters it robs them of the catharsis of seeing you share the anger that they feel at the things that get them angry, which is why they support you. Don't you feel more passionately about these things? Yes, I feel quite passionately about it, but I've always had the feeling that you, uh, that it serves no purpose to answer hate with hate. Uh, you see Jane Fonda and Ramsey Clark and their faces contorted and all the rest, and so I'm supposed to re respond with, uh, these people are so terrible and I hate them and so forth. I Don't may feel that. They are? And I may feel that, but I'm not going to express it. Do you? You say, it. see, you've, you've, again, no. you put the qualifier and you may feel that. No. Don't you? you have, from everything I, you say, you have to feel that. I have very strong feelings about them and what they, I did at the time. Uh, what they, uh, particularly uh, what they said about our POWs, for example, uh, that really infuriated me. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it would not have served any good purpose to get down in the gutter with them on that kind of thing. Uh, I stayed above it, and I think I'm going to continue to stay above it. What does that, uh, does that take an internal toll to, to have the, the, the calm and uh, discipline that you have outwardly? What does that do inside? Well, it tears you up some. Uh, it's a lot of turmoil. Uh, but on the other hand, I think, th I think a leader uh, has to be somewhat different from those that attack him. Uh, I've, I've taken quite a banging from the media, uh, from the best and the brightest over the years and so forth, and uh, sometimes, uh, like in 1962, when I told some of the press what I thought of them, um, I, uh, except for incidents like that, uh, I have not responded in kind. I've never canceled, for example, a, a subscription to a newspaper because of bad cartoons and editorials. If that were the case, I wouldn't have any newspapers to read. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I, th I think that, uh, uh, let me put it this way, when, when, when you get down on the ring there, when you answer hatred with hatred, you destroy yourself. I think they're destroying themselves with it. One uh, final question on Vietnam. You uh, resigned the presidency because of Watergate. Without Vietnam, uh, many of the attitudes and uh, elements uh, of Watergate wouldn't have existed. From that point of view, do you feel that you were in any way the last, the last American casualty of Vietnam? You know, well, some people have written that. Uh, it's an intriguing thesis. 
Uh, I guess I would have to respond this way, as you've already implied. If it had not been for Vietnam, there would have been no Pentagon Papers. There would have been no Ellsberg case. Uh, there would have been no plumbers. Uh, there would have been probably no wiretapping, uh, because most of that was really directly related or indirectly related to the need to keep uh, uh, a very tight ship during, a t uh, during wartime. Uh, there would have been no demonstrations, uh, certainly no demonstrations about Vietnam. Uh, so that's one side of it. In that sense, I suppose uh, I could be called a casualty. Uh, and then in another way, too, uh, I guess it would have to be said that uh, had it not been for Vietnam, uh, the outrage about Watergate would not have been as virulent as it was. After all, those, the best and the brightest, uh, have been embarrassed by the fact that we ended the war when they said it couldn't be done and ended it in an honorable way, uh, that we went to China, uh, that we had an arms negotiation with the Soviet Union, uh, some of the things which they had not achieved. And then we won an overwhelming election victory against their candidate, or the candidate of most of them, Senator McGovern. Uh, and uh, as, as they looked at those events, uh, I think they began to be concerned, as they should have been, about whether they were to continue to have the role that they had traditionally have uh, of being uh, those who controlled and directed uh, public opinion uh, and affected the decisions of government in the future. And I would say in that case uh, that uh, consequently when Watergate came uh, that it was manna from heaven. Now let me make it clear, Watergate was wrong, uh, it was stupidly handled, uh, uh, and as far as, uh, and we should have been attacked on it, uh, but I would say that <clears throat> when you, co you compare it with what happened previously, and this does not justify it, uh, the virulence of uh, the attackers uh, was to a certain extent due to the fact uh, that uh, uh, we had been through the Vietnam Syndrome, uh, and probably because we had succeeded when they said we couldn't succeed. Perhaps that's uh, a theory that some won't buy. But incidentally, as far as the last casualty is concerned, I'd like to uh, bring all this esoteric talk, and of course this is that, that uh, psychohistory that I, as you know, I have very little use for. Uh, who, I remember the last casualty, and uh, I would say that it was one of the most moving experiences I had in the White House. Uh, I uh, am, am known I'm considered to be, as you already implied, a non-emotional person. Uh, I know, for example, that it's often said that uh, po politicians, political leaders, are, are monsters of self-control. Well, that isn't quite true. I, uh, Winston Churchill, for example, when he was dictating his great speech about we will fight on the beaches, we will fight in the cities, we will fight in our homes, we will never surrender, the tears were streaming down his cheek. And I remember Eisenhower used to tell me that when Churchill would argue his case before Eisenhower in the high councils, the tears would flow down his cheeks. Well, I'm not that way, uh, but uh, I am an emotional man. Uh, I just believe in controlling it, and I'm pretty good at it. Uh, I recall only three incidents when uh, I was unable to control my uh, emotions when I was president. One was when Eisenhower died. Uh, I don't know yet why it happened, and yet I do in a way. Uh, Mel Laird was in the office. We were discussing the next withdrawal program for Vietnam, or which had not yet occurred, but we were, what, which was going to occur in a few months after that. And uh, Bob Haldeman interrupted us. He came in, which he never does aren't normally when I'm talking to anybody else, and I knew it was something important. He said, Mr. President, the general has just died. And all of a sudden, I... Uh, I burst out into tears, and I suppose I should have said something for the ages or that sort of thing, but all I could say was, he was such a strong man. And the second occasion uh, was one that uh, has also been well publicized, of course, uh, was at the time I resigned, the day I made the resignation speech. Uh, I met with my supporters, Democrats and Republicans, who had stuck with me on Vietnam and when I went to Russia and to China and so forth, uh, and stuck with me during the Watergate period. 
and uh, I had to tell them about resigning. And uh, it was a very emotional uh, uh, moment. The whole cabinet room was packed, and people were hanging on every word. And uh, so I thanked them for what they had done and for the years that we had worked together, because many of them went back over 30 years with me, back to 1947 when I came to the Congress. And finally, as I was reaching a conclusion, I was saying something to the effect that I only regret that I've let you down. And I looked across the table, and there was uh, uh, the uh, Les Ahrens, who uh, was the minority whip for the Republicans, an old friend, a dear friend from Illinois. And I remember he had his face in his hands, and the tears were coming down his cheeks. He was sobbing. And uh, I couldn't control myself. I had to leave the room. Fifteen minutes later, I had to go on national television and make a speech. I still don't know how I did it. The other incident is not known. It involved the last casualty, the really last casualty in Vietnam. Uh, this officer, I believe he was an officer, might have been an enlisted man, I don't recall the day. He had been killed the day before uh, the ceasefire went into effect in Vietnam. And so I was receiving his widow and his two children in the Oval Office. It was difficult. They were such fine-looking uh, people, very dignified. Uh, and I tried to tell them in simple words, as simply as I could, uh, how much we appreciated what he had done and how much we regretted the loss.